look around the kitchen. We're gonna make morels, a really easy morel dish, uh, basically crostini or, or morel toasts. Here are uh, our dried morels that are uh, soaking in um, water, warm water. They've been soaking for about a half an hour now. Um, we're gonna uh, use this wonderful bread that Amanda made. Um, it's, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Michael? Uh, it's a no-knead bread. Um, and uh, it takes about 20 hours to make, but there's a, just mostly a lot of waiting. Um, and um, the, the ingredients are basically the morels, saute them in butter. Um, uh, with some cha some shallots, and then uh, continue to saute them. Add some of the soaking liquid from the from the soaking of the morels, uh, and then toward the end, a little white wine, a little heavy cream, salt and pepper, and maybe some chives. And they go on the toasts, and that's it. So it's a very simple recipe, and one of the reasons to do it that way is I like the taste of the morels. Uh, so simple recipes like that allow you to actually experience the taste of the morels rather than covering it up with bacon or deep frying them or stuff like that. Um, so that's the plan. Amanda's going to start. Actually, this question might be actually good to ask now. Sure. Go um, for the mor um, to soak the morels, is the water boiling or warm from the? Oh food? no, just warm, warm out of the tap. Um, you know, uh, this sort of thing, I, I'm not a, my <laughs> um, I, a lot of people may have different ways of doing things and I'm sure they would love to, to share at the end, um, ways that they prepare morels. Um, but, uh, uh, this was our idea for a simple recipe for the purposes of this uh, presentation. They're also good on pizzas. Um, they're good, uh, and pasta, as they're really good in pasta. pasta dishes. Yeah. Um, so Amanda's going to work on that and we can talk about sort of like have an introduction to morels. Um, uh, so the first thing I thought I might talk about is what makes morels different from other mushrooms. Um, well, first of all, they're delicious. They have a kind of, um, meaty umami flavor. It's maybe slightly nutty. Um, and they uh, also can't be cultivated uh, with a few notable exceptions. Um, they, have a, they have associations with certain trees. And so you really can't just grow mushrooms in your basement. Um, they keep coming back year after year to the same spots. So when you find a place where you can uh, pick morels, you can, in good years when the weather is right, expect to see them again and again and again. Um, for a long time, decades really. Um, but uh, you know, morels are special because people think they're special. I mean, uh, there's a kind of a cultish quality to them among the mushroomers who, who value them. Um, and there are a lot of things that sort of uh, can account for that cultishness. Like they, they are the first uh, good edible mushroom that comes out uh, after you've been cooped up all winter in your house, if that's, the kind of mushroomer you are. They come out in the spring, so it's like your first shot, and the weather is beautiful, and the birds are singing, and the flowers are blooming, and it's time to go find morels. So there's that. They're also hard to find, so uh, a lot of mushroom hunters uh, consider it a point of pride. It's a part of the prowess that they can display, uh, being able to find morels in uh, places that they They've very carefully uh, researched and, and discovered and keep very secret, usually. Um, most morel hunters don't share their, their secret spots. Um, but what else makes morels... I think you're ready for the... Yeah, you can cut them up a little bit. Sure. Mm -hmm. the, other thing, the other things, though, that make morels uh, different as mushrooms is their morphology, their physical structure. Um, <laughs> Here's a black morel. Um, I found this in a New York City park. 
in a borough that starts with the letter B. Um, that's all I'll tell you. And uh, take a look at it and you'll see that a morella is a mushroom that doesn't have gills. Monica uh, has, a, has a portobello mushroom. I'm gonna use a portobello mushroom as a sort of a counter example. Portobello mushroom like you would, you would go and buy at your grocery store. Uh, show us the bottom of the portobello mushroom there, Monica. You all know what a portobello mushroom looks like, but uh, the feature that's different here is that portobello mushrooms have gills, and the gills are the structures where the spores develop. There they are. I usually, when I make portobello uh, burgers, I usually scrape the gills off. Does anybody else do that? Anyway, switch back to me. How small they are. So you see, um, not, not too small. I like big chunks. Me too. Yeah. I'm thinking just like this. So um, your average portobello mushroom uh, and your average morel mushroom are in the same kingdom. They're both in kingdom fungi. Um, but at the very next taxonomic level, that's where the similarity uh, ends. Uh, the portobello mushroom is a basidiomite, the phylum, uh, I, th this is the way I learned it in, um, in high school biology, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, or is it family order? Yeah, for order, family, genus, species. The phylum that contains uh, portobello mushrooms is Basidiomycota, um, and as um, morels are in a completely separate phylum, the phylum Ascomycota. So they differ that much. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> Morels uh, produce their spores on, cell on internal structures, internally inside acai. Um, the portobello mushrooms that uh, Monica had and all other basidiomycetes produce their spores on external structures called basidia. And I have a good demonstration of uh, what you how you might imagine that. Um, imagine that this, uh, this is a, we're gonna look at the gill of a, of a portobello mushroom and it's lined with basidia. And the basidia are like the, this fork and there are scads of them on a gill and the spores on the ends of the basidia are these olives. Um, and they're all over the, the faces of the, of the gills of that, portobello mushroom. Now, an ascomycete like a, like a morel produces the spores inside internal structures, as I said, called acai. And you can think of those like uh, peas in a pod, where the ascus itself is, is the pod, and the spores, eight of them usually, uh, are the peas inside the pod. That pretty clear? Um, so I can make it more clear actually. Can go here? Yes, I am. Go ahead and turn that on. Um, because I brought uh, into my kitchen, which is something I don't normally do, my microscope, which I love. And um, I can show you an ascus, the spore producing structure, uh, using my uh, microscope here. I've got a slide that I produced about a half an hour ago and hopefully it's not completely dried out. There it is. Yeah. Go ahead and, and highlight that. This is a, a crushed piece of tissue from, from this very mushroom, the one that I just showed you. And here we are, we're looking at it. I'm showing it to you at uh, 40 magnification. We zoom in. It has, there we are at 100 magnification. I'm going to find us a nice ascus that we can look at. And here, oh, that's an empty one. It shot all of its spores already. But here, let's look. Uh, I should have found one earlier. Wait, we're going back. <laughs> Hold on, back up. There we go. There's a good one. Okay, put it in the pan. So there's an ascus right there. You see it in the center of your screen, and it really looks like sort of a, a transparent tube sock, and it has eight spores. Count them, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, look at that one, only has seven. 
So it probably shot one spore. Um, the spores on, um, in ascomycetes are inside those assi and they're ejected forcefully uh, using hydrostatic pressure out of those, out of those assi. Uh, are there any other good ones to look at? There are just a whole bunch of spores. So those, those sort of uh, ellipsoid uh, uh, things that you see are the thousands and thousands of spores from that single piece of little piece of tissue that I grabbed uh, off of the, the morel. Monica, you can switch back to me now. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed that. I thought it's kind of cool to be able to look through the microscope and, uh, and uh, see those structures on a Zoom meeting. Um, how's it going with the... Um, the morels. Ma it's good. You want to see? Amanda's Here's got the, the morels in the pan. Shallots, butter, morels. That's it. And we cook them, and we cook them eh, medium heat, medium high heat, for uh, fifteen to twenty minutes. Adding the uh, adding the soaking liquid as needed. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, are morels that are in our area. People always want to know what they can find and where they can find it. And I can help you uh, in both of those. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly where to find them, but I can help you uh, in terms of habitat. So we're going to, I'm going to share my screen now and we'll go over to this document I've prepared. Morels. Um, uh, this is where we're going to do look at them in terms of what features you can use to identify them, various varieties of morel that we have in our area. And by our area, I mean New England, uh, the northeastern United States. Um, I w might also talk about what's found in New York City, uh, if I haven't mentioned it already. Um, and of course, every presentation uh, that starts that's about morels really ought to have, um, shoot, really needs to have a little bit of uh, mushroom porn. Um, so this is uh, uh, some photographs from a, a, a little expedition uh, that I had with Tom Bigelow, who's pictured here. He's the president of the uh, uh, New York Mycological Society and uh, also a fantastic hunter of morels. Um, So the first uh, type of morel that we'll uh, talk about is probably everybody's favorite, um, the yellow morel, uh, common name. Um, and I'll go into some Latin names because I like Latin names. They tell us a lot about the things that we're looking at. Latin name often, when you look them up in field guides that have been written um, maybe 10 years ago or earlier, you're going to see the Latin name Morcella exculenta. All of the morels, the true morels, are in the genus Morcella. You'll see the name Morcella esculenta, but unfortunately, that is incorrect. And that is a real bummer for the state of Minnesota, because they went out of their way to designate a state mushroom. The state mushroom they designated was the yellow morel, and uh, turns out uh, they, they, they designated it using the Latin name Morcella esculenta, and it turns out that Morcella esculenta, uh, a European mushroom uh, named and described in Europe centuries ago, doesn't occur in the United States. Uh, molecular studies, meaning uh, gene sequencing uh, of certain segments of genes of morels the world over, uh, has... Um, has determined that our yellow morel on the east coast of the United States uh, is not the same as Morcella esculenta. And esculenta, by the way, means good to eat, delicious, esculent. Um, so our morel, the yellow morel, is Morcella americana in the northeast of the United States. There are other yellow morels that are in different regions in the United States, difficult to tell apart from um, Morcella americana, but um, in our region, we don't have to worry about that too much yet. We don't know. 
never know. So let's look at them. Um, Morcella esculent, uh, sorry, Morcella americana. A lot of people look at them and, uh, or look at say the mushrooms in these, um, in, it, like these in these pictures and they, they feel like they're looking at two different species of mushroom. Um, you notice that the ones at the top are sort of gray uh, and the ones at the bottom are more sort of yellow or blonde. Um, these are in fact the same species of mushroom, Morcella americana in its sort of immature state as it's developing has these uh, dark gray pits and light gray, light gray ridges. As it develops and as it matures, you get a fully blonde uh, uh, morel. And you'll see that structure. This structure is what you're looking for. You're looking for what looks like a three-dimensional honeycomb that's sitting up on top of a stem. Um, it has the pits and the ridges that are sort of irregular in, in Morcella americana, but mostly oriented vertically, a little bit taller than they are wide, mostly. Um, and the thing that you uh, really want to make sure of, and you're new to finding mushrooms, is that you want to know that that thing that you think is a morel is hollow from tip to base. When you cut it in half, it's fully hollow. Um, oh, what else can I say about it? Oh, yes. Um, where do you find it? Uh, you want to look underneath uh, dying elms. You're going to want to look in derelict apple orchards because morels grow with old elms and with apple trees. They also grow with white and green ash. Um, I've not had as much luck finding them uh, with white and green ash, but uh, elms and derelict apple orchards. Quick story about derelict apple orchards. You, you might be picturing like a pleasant walk through an apple orchard, like where you go to, to pick apples on your own in the fall. Unfortunately, that's not what derelict apple orchards are like at all. They are uh, overrun by greenbrier, meaning prickers, and they are infested with ticks. You often have to cut your way through the greenbrier to get at the morels. Um, I did this with Tom one uh, Mother's Day, actually, uh, and I was, I was due to meet Amanda and her family uh, for a Mother's Day dinner uh, um, at Cafe Le Luc on Smith Street, and I was running a little late, so I went directly from the orchard to the restaurant. I proudly brought my bag of morels into the restaurant to show them off, and I sat down, and then I felt a bit of a tickle under my shirt. So I went to the men's room and I took off my shirt and I proceeded to remove five ticks from my belt line. Um, and I felt lucky that I only had five. Um, so derelict apple orchards are a good place to look. Dead elms, uh, dying elms. You're gonna find that a lot of the elms you come across in the woods are dying, uh, mostly because of Dutch elms disease. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Let's move on to another type of morel you might be likely to see in the Northeast. This is, uh, these are referred to as your black morels. And in the Northeast, the species that we have uh, most commonly is Morcella angusticeps. Um, you'll notice that it has basically the same configuration. It looks like a honeycomb that's been erected up on top of a, of a lighter colored stipe. It has those ridges and those pits. Um, but in this case, the ridges, especially when these are mature, these ridges are darker than the pits. Um, and again, like the yellow morel, when you cut this thing in half, it's gonna be hollow all the way from the tip to the base. Here is an illustration I did with, with, uh, with this morel right here. You don't have to spotlight me for this, I don't think. Um, but so that is a, a morel, a black morel that I've cut in half in the center, the two halves of it. And the arrows are pointing to the spot where the, where the cap uh, meets the stem. And you'll see that there's not really much of a transition between the cap and the stem. The, the examples on either side have a little bit more of a sort of a, a, sort of a, a overhang, I guess you'd call it. 
but uh, it's really not very much of an overhang. And that's another feature that uh, Black Morels, Morcella, and Gustaceps shares with um, most examples of the yellow morel that I showed earlier. Um, another type of morel that we uh, see in New York City. Oh, and by the way, also um, the black morel has, if you go north of here, like into Vermont, there's a, a second species of black morel that you might encounter that's uh, Morcella septentrionalis. Um, but if you're uh, as below the 45th parallel, you're probably not likely to see that. So these are the half free morels. And these are morels that, um, that we have in New York City. And uh, they are uh, referred to by the Latin name Morcella punctipes. Again, we have the ridges and the pits with the darker ridges and the lighter pits. They're vertically oriented. And again, this thing is hollow, 100% hollow from the very top of the cap all the way down to the base. But you will see that um, it's a little bit different from your other black and yellow morels. Um, you'll see that the point of attachment where the stem meets the cap is sort of underneath, halfway up the cap with some of the cap overhanging the stem, um, but not all the way, not quite all the way at the apex. So you can hold this up. Oh, so we can see that again. You know, same time. There's no. So uh, that sort of gives you a hint as why these are called the half free morels. The cap is half free of the stem. Um, so where are you gonna find half free morels? Um, they are most closely associated in New York City as far as I know uh, with tulip poplars, but they, it's possible to find them under other hardwoods. Um, then there's Morcella diminutiva. I'm not sure we could probably give them the common name diminutive morels. Uh, they are essentially like a yellow morel, but they're smaller. Um, they have the same sort of vertically oriented ridges and pits. Um, the stipe is usually somewhat longer and slender, sort of in relation to the size of the cap. I don't find these a lot. Um, so I'm not super familiar with them, but uh, they are also hollow all the way through from uh, top to bottom. Um, and you can find them under tulip poplar and white and green ash and possibly other hardwoods. Should we check in on the morels? Sure. Okay, see how it's going. You want to spotlight, uh, spotlight me for a moment, Monica? I think you yeah, have to go back. To oh, I have to stop sharing? I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, yes. All right, there we're we good, go. right? Right. We're a little more than halfway. We're a little more than halfway. Okay, I should talk talk faster, maybe. <laughs> that was not what I meant. <laughs> All right, going back to the presentation, uh, an important uh, question that you really uh, hear often from new mushroomers uh, is. What are the lookalikes? Are there any false morels? Yes, there are false morels. Um, uh, what the most commonly cited false morel is Gyrometra esculenta. Look at that name. It's esculent as though it's edible, but this uh, is the conifer false morel. Um, it comes out in approximately the same season, so it comes out in the spring. Um, and you can you look at this uh, structure and you immediately see how different it is from a true morel. Um, it doesn't have the ridges and pits. It has more of a kind of a, um, a sort of lobed uh, demeanor. And um, it looks a bit more like a brain. When you cut it in half, here's the dead giveaway. It is not hollow uh, from tip to stem. It is pitted and chambered. Um, and uh, it is found. Uh, under conifers, as the name suggests, the common name suggests, and it's mostly found in mountainous regions, montane regions. So I have found it in, I have found it in Vermont. I have not found it in New York City. Um, is it poisonous? Why, yes, it is. Um, the uh, conifer false morel produces a compound known as gyrometrin, 
which looks like this and hydrolyzes in the body to become monomethylhydrazine, uh, which is a substance, uh, a compound that is regularly used as rocket fuel. Um, so you can imagine just how toxic that compound must be. It is toxic and also carcinogenic. So what on earth is going on here? Um, this is a picture I found on Wikipedia, generously shared, of a market in an outdoor market in Finland, in Helsinki. And you're seeing here uh, crates and crates of that same mushroom, Gyrometra exculenta, for sale to eat. Uh, are the Finns suicidal? Um, they are not, uh, but they have a way of preparing this otherwise toxic mushroom uh, that renders it uh, edible. And I'll describe it for you because it's kind of fascinating. Uh, what you do is you gather a bunch of Gyrometra esculenta, you get a big pot full of water, and you put it on your stove. You bring that pot of water to a boil, and then you open up all the windows and doors in your kitchen. You put the false morels in the boiling water and you leave the kitchen because this, the, the steam coming out of the boiling water uh, contains the toxins that can be extremely harmful, deadly even. So you leave the kitchen while your, your, your mushrooms boil. Uh, after 10 minutes, you drain the mushrooms, then you do it again, boiling the mushrooms a second time, leaving the kitchen so that you don't inhale the, uh, the toxic fumes. And then you drain the water after the second boil and you basically prepare them the way Amanda is preparing these morels here with butter and saute them and cook them um, and they become edible. Now, uh, do I recommend that you do this? I do not. Um, I wouldn't do it. Um, knowing that they are toxic, knowing that they are carcinogenic, um, knowing that I'm the sort of person who kind of doubts that I'm doing something right the first time that I do it. Um, so doing it wrong the first time it could have consequences. So I don't usually, I don't think I would do it. But I do know people who have. Um, there are members of, former members of the New York Club, uh, Ben Kinsley and Jessica Langley, um, came across them in the Adirondacks and ate them, uh, preparing them in this way. They had with them a, a friend who was from Finland. So that was a plus. Um, but again, don't recommend. Do not recommend. Anyway, onward. More false morels. Here's one that you might be able to find in New York City. This one is Gyrometra corfii. It is named after uh, Richard Korf, a brilliant uh, mycologist who studied ascomycetes. Um, it has, again, you know, you're seeing a, a pattern here. The gyrometras have lobes and folds rather than ridges and pits. And also this mushroom is not hollow, it's chambered inside. It's found in New York City, it's found under hardwoods. We find it in Cunningham Park. Is it poisonous? I don't know. It probably isn't. Um, you know, there are a lot of mushrooms when you look in field guides. Probably not yummy. Where they, um, the edibility, if, if it's a field guide that includes information about edibility, they'll just say unknown. Um, so, unknown. Other uh, things that might look like morels that are not morels. You have uh, these two verpas. Uh, verpa bohemica on the left, verpa conica on the right, unless Zoom makes it backwards. By, no, no, they don't. Actually. <laughs> so, verpa bohemica, clearly verpa conica on the right is a very flat, smooth cap. So, it doesn't really look much like a morel. Uh, people eat them. Um, Verpa bohemica is a little, more, little bit more brain-like, but you see it sort of uh, doesn't really have ridges and pits. Again, it has more sort of folds. It's more brain-like. Although uh, I'm told that in maturity, Verpa bohemica uh, can look a lot like a morel. Um, but here's the other clue about Verpa bohemica to separate it, especially from Morchella punctipes, the half-free morel. Uh, this is an illustration that shows those two mushrooms side by side. On the left, Verpa bohemica, you see the, the uh, stem comes up underneath the cap and it really attaches here at the, at the very apex of the underside of the cap, almost like 
uh, Michael Kuo, a, a mushroom expert who has a, a website called mushroomexpert.com, uh, says it looks like a thimble balancing on a pencil. Over here you have uh, the, a true morel, mor Morcella punctipes, and you see that as the uh, stem ascends to the cap, it joins the cap at a point a little bit below the apex. Um, so a very, very subtle difference, uh, but a difference that uh, you should certainly try to, uh, to, to see if you're not sure. Um, the other difference that's actually quite striking, but you need a microscope to tell, is that um, you see here, here's an ascus with, uh, this is the ascus for Verpa bohemica, and it's got two spores. It's a two-spored ascus. It's an un unusual for an ascomyce to have just two spores, where over here, Morcella punctipes has eight spores. Um, so, Uh, that is, uh, that's my slideshow. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I forgot to say where you find, um, oh, another thing about the verpas, by the way. The verpas, uh, when you cut the stipe, another good clue is that it's not hollow. It's got little wispy pieces, little wispy elements inside, like cotton candy. Um, and also, what trees does it grow under? I'm not really sure. Um, some older field guides will tell you that verpas are poisonous. Um, they'll say that you could get stomach cramps from eating them or that you could lose coordination. Um, it's probably not true. Maybe it's true with certain individuals who are sensitive to uh, a mushroom that they didn't know they were sensitive to. Um, but uh, the consensus that's sort of building now is that verpas are not poisonous. So if you made that mistake, you'd probably be okay. Claude. Yeah. I'm going wine. Oh yes, Amanda is going to add the wine. Okay, why, is that cool? I'm just yeah. trying to do wine and then I'm gonna do cream and chives, right? Or deglaze. So this is a cooking show, we need to see some cooking. There's cooking. There we go, good. That's it. That's it? I think that's it. And then the cream sauce. Yeah, in a moment, and then we're going to cream and chives. Chives and then And then, you know, we're ready. OK, I do have some, some more things to consider um, about morel hunting and morels in general, and mushrooms in general, and that's contamination. Um, morels are uh, uh, excellent bioaccumulators. Um, they pick up heavy metals really well. And I think they also can accumulate hydrocarbons. Um, and you should know that a lot of apple orchards, uh, starting in the mid 19th century and through, I believe, the 1930s or even 1970s, I'd, I'd have to look it up, they were treated with a pesticide. And the pesticide uh, most commonly in use was lead arsenate. Um, so in a lot of apple, derelict apple orchards, there's the potential that there could be lead arsenate contaminating the soil. Um, another little aside, um, not a happy aside, unfortunately, there was a member of the New Jersey Club uh, who um, loved morels, really loved them. And he discovered that the US uh, GA maps that uh, the United States government produced from the 1940s on, or 30s on, uh, showed on the maps the exact location of apple orchards. Um, and so very brilliantly, he used these maps in the 1970s and 1980s to drive around and look for what remained of these old apple orchards and he collected a lot of morels. He loved them so much, he would do as I do, uh, collect them and dry them uh, and uh, eat them all year round. His wife did not love morels, and so she did not eat them. Oh, <laughs> um, well, uh, sadly, he began to develop symptoms of arsenic poisoning, and uh, his doctors recognized this and suggested, I believe, that he stop eating morels, um, and I think that uh, he just did not, not take that advice and eventually succumbed. His wife um, did not. Did not. Um, so uh, there's that kind of sad uh, anecdote. 
to give you a warning about not eating contaminated mushrooms, certainly not mushrooms that come from contaminated uh, apple orchards. And certainly you could take a little shovel full of soil and have it tested by a university laboratory uh, to find out if your favorite apple orchard was contaminated. Um, but also remember, you shouldn't be collecting mushrooms and eating mushrooms that are near uh, well-traveled roads, mines, for instance, if there's a mine in the woods, uh, uh, avoid picking mushrooms near mines or anything. Chernobyl, don't eat mushrooms from Chernobyl. Um, another thing to consider, there, uh, there is a, I didn't talk about them here, but m morels that you might get um, by mail order uh, are often burn site morels. So they're black morels that uh, prefer uh, sites of uh, wooded areas that have been burned with forest fires. So morel pickers know that they can uh, keep track of forest fires during the summer season and then the next spring come to that site and pick thousands and thousands of these burn site morels. Um, however, it's possible that um, the forest fires uh, were fought using uh, chemical, um, chemical fire suppression, like those, those chemicals that they douse fires with from airplanes. And so it's possible that those contaminants could be accumulated in the mushrooms. Um, a few other things to consider, like habitat loss is our main um, foe in terms of having uh, good morel harvests. Um, you know that there's a derelict apple orchard that you can go to uh, and you go year after year and then one day you go and it's gone. It's uh, now a housing development. Um, and also the elms that uh, morels, yellow morels in particular, prefer uh, have been completely wiped out uh, in most areas by Dutch elm disease. Um, you can drive down uh, the main streets of most American towns and you drive past a street called Elm Street. You would be hard pressed to find an elm on any one of those streets. Um, they're gone. Like I said before, you have to cook morels. Um, you have to cook all of your mushrooms. That's true. Amanda is correct. You shouldn't be eating raw mushrooms. If you're putting raw mushrooms on your salad, yeah, That's don't it. do that. Mushrooms are made, uh, the major cellular component in mushrooms is chitin, which is the same structure, the same uh, uh, compound that's in your fingernails, and it's also in the carapaces of insects. So that's something you want to cook to kind of break down before you, you put it in your body. Um, you cook morels because you can, if you eat them raw, you can suffer from gastrointestinal upset. Um, there's a story that, about something that happened in the 90s, uh, a banquet for the retirement of the chief of police in Vancouver, British Columbia. And a chef made a pasta salad and on it he included raw morels. And 77 of the 483 guests who ate at the banquet uh, suffered in uh, intestinal distress, including what was described as some very impressive vomiting. Um, uh, and then there's the, the potential for food allergies. Uh, a mushroom could be completely 100% edible, um, but you might just be allergic to it. So if you're eating a mushroom for the first time that you've foraged in the woods, it's a good idea to just try a small amount. Don't pig out on the first go. Um, let's see. Oh, this is something very cool that I, uh, I would love to show off. Um, oh, that's so weird. During, right now. During the course, I don't know if this is going to be uh, very visible. But during the course of my talking, um, on the counter, you see here the morels that were lying on the counter uh, dropped a whole bunch of spores. So you, this little white patch here, what happened? No, she tried to spot like this one. Oh, okay. But go back. Yeah, this is much better. Uh, this little white patch here is... Uh, Oh, there you go. There you go. Those are morel spores. Um, so if you're interested in, in uh, All right, bring a sec. if you're interested in doing this uh, for yourself and you're a beginner, I can recommend getting a good guidebook. Um, that's always a good start. I started with the Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Mushrooms. I was 
fortunate enough to become acquainted with um, and mentored by the author, Gary Linkoff. Um, and it's a really good book for mushrooms in our area. Um, other things you can do is join a mushroom club. It, you know, you really can't learn mushrooms from a book. It's something that does really require face-to-face, -face, you know, face-to-mushroom interaction, face-to-face -face interaction with people who know what they're doing. Unfortunately, in a pandemic, that's not entirely possible. We're doing the best we can. But I recommend joining a mushroom club. And you can consult good mushroom websites. For instance, in order to confirm the, the tree associates with the mushrooms that we talked about tonight, I, I used mushroomexpert.com, Michael Kuo's website, which is an excellent website for uh, beginners looking to learn as much as they can about mushrooms. Um, so um, that's all I got. Uh, we can open it up to discussion, um, and Amanda and I can enjoy our our morale. Our anniversary morale. Our anniversary morales. Does uh, anyone have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, so thank you so much, Ethan. Uh, that was awesome. There was a lot going on in this chat. There was a ton of things going on, and a lot of the questions were already answered um, by some. Um, very um oh, and moza is that one person that definitely answered a lot thank you uh but if i i don't want to go through these questions now because there's so many so i think whoever had those questions and, and they're still not answered maybe should I, see one, I see one i do see one that i can that i can uh address someone asked about the paper by eleanor shavit uh, uh eleanor shavit is a a, a a person that many of us in the New York club know. Uh, she's from Boston and she's in the Boston club. She's a mycologist and a gemologist. And um, she's gonna be talking with our club uh, uh, pretty soon by Zoom, I think, we hope, about uh, mushrooms trapped in amber, a really fascinating subject. So prehistoric mushrooms trapped in amber. Um, she did a study with some collaborators uh, after the poisoning incident uh, the gentleman in the New Jersey club, uh, where she went around and tested the soil at various, um, at various, I, I think her, her survey tested the soil at various apple orchards to determine the, the, the extent of the contamination. And she found that it's very spotty. Um, some, some orchards, yes, some orchards, no. Um, the question suggested that maybe she had found that the the morels did not accumulate lead arsenate. Um, I haven't read the paper in a few years. I'm pretty sure that um, the finding was that they 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 accumulate uh, a compound. It might not be lead arsenate, but um, uh, maybe something slightly uh, morphed from that. I, I'm not a chemist, so I'm sorry I can't really talk in great detail about that. Maybe, actually, um, Juniper, do you happen to know? Juniper went to bed. No? Nope, there she is. Can she unmute? Where are you? Sorry, it just took me a minute to find my mute button. Um, somebody sent a link to Eleanor's article, which I, from Fungi Magazine, which I think would be the best source for that information. Um, but yes, I think you're right, Ethan, that um, it, it was, not lead arsenate, but that you could still get. There were contaminants that weren't necessarily lead arsenate. Yeah. But, yeah. And then um, there's oh. also another question in the chat now from Andy Clark. What does that mean for the, the life cycle and that particular morale? What does what mean? The, the contamination? It has poured all its... Uh, I don't know. So I was just, that was a question I'd asked when you were showing your, um, your micro, uh, the mushroom under oh, your yeah. microscope, Ethan, that all of those spores weren't in the acid, ac whatever yes, yeah. that is. Um, so, so they're all out of it or they're, you know, um, does that mean that that mushroom is about to die? No, no. Those spores um, have been ejected. Um, it's like a flower sending out it, it, its pollen. It's pollen. Or, right, and yes, the or seed. You can yeah. think of the mushroom as the flower, right? Right. 
when you like so yes another important point when you pick a mushroom you're not picking the whole organism it's not the whole plant it's the reproductive structure and the 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 mm. the mo the larger component of the organism is underground um you're just picking the reproductive structure so and then so like so if if that if that mushroom had all of its like the eight spores intact right does that just mean that it's i mean is it younger Am yeah I, the, the, exactly or you know, the, the the or the situation isn't right like the conditions aren't right 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 the the, the mushroom has to grow it has to develop the assay the spores have to develop inside the assay they line up and they wait um for environmental conditions to be right in order to uh uh for them to be ejected they, they get shot out the end of that ascus uh at high speed and that's sometimes when you come across ascomycete mushrooms not so much um morels but sometimes uh things like pizizas you sort of you can cup it in your hands and you'll just see almost like a puff of smoke come out of it that's the spores um ejecting into the air currents when you're holding the mushroom and that's essentially well what i did was i put a little pinch of tissue on a slide and it, in a in a droplet of water and the the assay in that droplet of water must have been just like hey it's time and shot those spores out anybody else got a how do they taste <laughs> so good. thank you for asking juniper they are delicious mm. let's see so somebody else asked how uh, whether you can eat morels that were found in new york city yeah, I think so. I hope. I sure hope so, because I am. <laughs> Maybe not right now. Oh, hey, Matt. Hey, Matt. Hey. Um, is there anything, so morels can't be cultivated, but if, uh, say, someone has an apple orchard and they see morels there, is there anything they can do to, um, you know, uh, improve the, con the growing conditions for said morels? I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. I'm not. Do to the mushrooms or anything? Feed the mushrooms. One thing I think I know about morels is that they appear to like alkaline soil. So you could experiment with adding lime to the soil if that, okay. but I don't, you know, I don't think that that, I don't know if that's really going to work. Um, what if you have a little spot to test? If you could test it, we'd, we'd love to find that out. That would be really interesting. Anybody, uh, like for instance, Paul, do you know anything that about how you could encourage them, if you can encourage them? I think Paul, Paul might have signed off. Okay. No, no, we're here. We're here. Oh, hi. Oh, good. Hi. So I'm sorry, what was the question? Well, the question was whether if you have an, an, an old apple orchard and you wanted to encourage the growth of, of morels that already like, grew. say you found one morel. And you wanted to... My suggestion was to add lime to the soil? No, I don't think that no? is going to... What will be the likelihood is... It, what it seems to be is that the, the situation is that the, uh, the morels are actually rather ubiquitous. Uh -huh. Years ago, Lynn Payer made a list of the trees around which morels were found. And it was like every tree you ever heard of. Right. I mean, there were a lot of trees. And so it seems as though the morel will fruit when its host is dying. It's one, one of these distress, at least the yellow morels, uh, will uh, fruit when their situation is in distress. Right. The tree so around the elm tree, when the elm tree dies, it drops all, all of its nutrients into the ground. Um, this is uh, it, it, propitious for the the mycorrhiza of, of the morel to be able to generate the energy to put up fruiting bodies. And to find and, a new host, essentially. I'm sorry. And yeah. to find a new host. And, 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 and they will essentially uh, fruit for a few years uh, after that elm dies, and then you will not find them anymore around that elm. And around tulip poplar, uh, those morels, you can go back year after year after year after year. And, right. and, and you will find them in those places. Huh. 
Somebody else had a question about whether the Morels were vampiric. And I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between the Morels and the trees. That is a fantastic question. Thank you, Michael. Or whoever. That's Michael. I know. But, um, uh, or whoever asked that question, right? Um, the relationship between the, the um, tree and the morel is not entirely understood, but it is assumed that uh, the morel is both mycorrhizal at some point during its life cycle, meaning that it, um, it behaves in a symbiosis with the tree, swapping nutrients at some point in its life cycle, and that it's saprophytic at a, another point in its life cycle. So saprophytic meaning it is, um, um, it is digesting the wood of the tree host, um, usually dead wood. So it's both. The relationship is, is um, for the morels, uh, both my, mycorrhizal and saprophytic, um, but it hasn't been studied, as far as I know anyway, uh, hasn't been studied to any uh, great degree with all of the species of Morcella and is not very uh, un well understood in detail. I'm, I could be someone, anyone who wants to um, contradict me on that, please chime in. Um, I think Scott has a good question like that. Scott, you wanna ask that yourself? Hi, Scott. Scott, are you here? Otherwise, I mean, I can ask you. It's, um, he just, he's asking if the soil, um, it could be replaced if the, if the, if they, so the question is, can you replace most of the common uh, contaminated soil and use the original soil to grow no. the morels? In other no. words, do morels, do morels leach the toxins from the soil? The, uh, the, the first part of that question, can you replace the soil? No, because you would damage the, you would to totally damage the um, mycelia that are in the soil. The, the mycelia of the mushroom grows in the soil. If you replace that soil, you would basically kill the mushroom, the, kill the organism. The second part of that question, um, do they leach the toxins from the soil? Can you replace most of the contaminated soil and use some original soil to grow the morels? Uh, they, yeah, they, they, they're bioaccumulators, like I said. They are removing the toxins from the soil. So they're, a lot of, in a lot of instances, not necessarily with, with morels, mushrooms are being studied um, to see how they will perform as, as bioremediators, mycoremediators, to use, uh, use them in a scaled up uh, fashion is the, the hope, the goal for the future, to cultivate them in contaminated places to remove the contamination uh, from those places, from that soil, from water even. Um, most of the experiments are being done around uh, oyster mushrooms uh, in, in mycoremediation. Uh, and as far as I understand it, uh, at this point, it seems promising, but they haven't been able to deliver the scale that would be necessary to really clean up a toxic site. Um, Can I say something? There yeah, was a question ball. about drying morels. Yes. You should address that. Okay, so um, my morels, um, you, you, you bring them home and you have the option to eat them fresh or to dry them and save them for a pandemic. Um, I have eaten. I have eaten them fresh. Here's here's a bag. I I've covered over the. I usually label them to so that, uh, I know when I uh, collected them. This one's from May twentieth of twenty eighteen. But I put a little tape over the location. So you can't see where. Um, I'm that careful. Um, I uh, you can eat them fresh. I bring them home. I cook them and eat them fresh. Uh, it's a treat, but um, they are actually... I like them better dried. Almost better dried. The drying of the mushroom sort of uh, um, concentrates the flavor when you, re when you rehydrate them. Um, and they're just so good. Um, so I have a... Uh, describe how you dry them? Is it a, do you use a drying thing or, or that's made for that purpose or some simpler... 
Yeah, it's a, it's a food dehydrator that you can buy, you know, uh, for m most people use it to, to dry fruits or make beef jerky, but um, you can use the same sort of food dehydrator to dry morels. You could it, probably do it in your oven if your oven no, goes no, low, low enough. No, 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 no. But no. Our oven, some ovens go low enough. So you want to dry, dry your morels at a low temperature. They most, have to go low enough. Most, most ovens do not. Most people's ovens don't go low enough. I so I dry mine. I put the food dehydrator on 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a hot day. And I have the fan run for 24 hours. You dry them until they're cracker dry, like saltine cracker dry. Um, if you've been collecting morels in the rain and they're sort of waterlogged, it will take longer. you might want to turn them over halfway through the drying. Um, you dry them till they're cracker dry and then you put them in a bag and you put them uh, someplace dry for them to keep. Oh, yeah, we use our uh, wine refrigerator. Uh, spotlight us here, if you, if you will, um, Monica. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, uh, wow. So we have a wine refrigerator. But we, we don't really drink that much fancy wine, and we really use it more as a morel refrigerator. Also, we keep our, <laughs> our peanut butter and uh, chocolate also. It holds chocolate at a really good temp. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I have morels in there going back to 2016 when, um, when I really got going at, at, at morel hunting. Um, I think there's a, a question that maybe is also interesting from Margaret, Margaret Dorn. Margaret, do you want to ask it yourself? Um, Hi, Margaret. Margot. Margot. Margot, sorry. That's okay. I was going to ask just if it's worth going back to spots after you've harvested, like if they um, keep growing in the same, it, yes. it, subsequently. Absolutely. So, um, for instance, the black morels that I found These just, just this spring, Yes, these guys. Um, they're from a spot in one of the five boroughs that begins with B. And I went there uh, in late April. Oh, yeah, like two well, weeks ago. Two, two weeks ago. And there were about 20 of them. And then we went back. And I harvested them all. And then we went back last Saturday. And there were these three a more. A few more. A few more. And so you can go and get multiple flushes. Um, a week later, two weeks later, it depends on how lucky you are. But yes. It's a good question. Uh, and maybe uh, Daniel Greenba Greenbaum, do you want to talk about your successfully, uh, how you successfully grew a morel? You grew a, a morel? What? Yeah, please share the details. How did you grow a morel? I grew a morel. Can you hear me? I can hear yes. you. No, can see. Okay. First of all, thank you. Your presentation rocked. I really enjoyed it. Um, so for the past two years, I've been finding morels uh, in mm -hmm. old apple orchard, as you said, and uh, also around tulip poplars. And um, two years ago, I found a whole bunch of morels, actually not a whole bunch, three, that were just really uh, too far gone to eat. But I brought them home and I put them in the blender with water and I blended it. Mm -hmm. And then I put that in a five gallon bucket of water. So I diluted three old morels in five gallons of water. And in my backyard, I poured it um, just in a corner, a shaded corner along the fence uh, in an area just wondering what, what would happen. And um, in part of that area, uh, I dumped the fire pit after, you know, I burned some logs. And actually, um, last week, for the first time, a single morel grew from that area. <laughs> um, and my backyard, uh, the woods, there are no trees here. Um, and so I definitely put the mycelium there. So uh, the question was how to encourage growth. I'm not sure if the, uh, the fire pit changed the, uh, the alkalinity or pH of the soil, but specifically in that spot is where this morel grew. Um, so okay. experiment worked. That's super cool. Do you, what kind of morel was it? Um, it was... Uh, growing in association with tulip opera, I believe it was uh, Americana, okay. right? Americana. Oh, so it was a yellow morel, like a, like a. No, no, no. Probably Angusticeps. Well, that's a black morel. Right, or oh. Deliciosa. 
Those grow in association with tulip poplars. Tulip poplars. You, you, um, do you have pictures of it? Because it would be lovely to I see. I do. I do. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can share my screen from the um, from the. Oh, you're on the phone, from, right? Yeah, but I um I put it on my Instagram. So if anyone is curious, and I actually put a put a video uh, as well explaining what what I had done. So if you're interested, um, easy to remember. Dan, my name. Uh -huh. Dan is a fun guy. So oh, at I, Dan is a fun guy. Instagram.com. Let's see if I can bring it up. Um, oh, yeah, good idea. Um, that's very cool that you that you were able to do that. Um, and um, I do have a tulip poplar uh, sapling. It's about um, five years old. So that's also right here. Uh, so my intention was to inoculate or to see the the um, to see the mycelium around this this tulip poplar. So. The variables I think that worked are the young tulip poplar plus the fire pit. Um, I Monica, think I Monica, um, share my screen. Uh, oh my God, that's a that's a yellow. Yeah, I think, that's Americana. I think that's a diving yard. That is a yellow morel. That's Morchella wow. Americana. You've got the real deal. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, they're I guess you know they they're opportunistic. Uh, I it seems to me. They're not going to reject a chance. I'm, I'm not certain if that's going that spot is going to be um, something that would produce year after year. My my intuition. I could be wrong, and I do hope I'm wrong for your for your, for your <laughs> sake because that's pretty cool. But my 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 intuition would be that because the tree is not there, that that this is going to want to grow in association with, that you might not get long-term regeneration spring following spring. Um, but hey, right. I could be wrong. I, I hope I, I agree. And, and I think I created a condition of uh, perhaps the dying tree because right. you, the- You um, created a crisis for the right, mushroom. Right, it was the burn site. <laughs> Correct. Right. The burn site, but also it didn't have its host. The mycelium right. is in the ground and it says, oh, there's no tree. It what thinks its tree died because why else would it be in the ground? Right. Uh, so therefore, it, it produced a morel. Yeah, possibly. But that's, that's an so interesting more, experiment. So if you find the bad ones, uh, they're still worth bringing home and blending and pouring. If you have a little yard spot, uh, try the experiment out. We will do that. Very cool. Any other questions? Yeah, if I miss anybody in the chat there uh, with a good question, please please just unmute yourself and and ask. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I've got some morels to eat. I I have another question about the um, the length of fruiting of the season. Um, typically, is it like into the middle of May, or how late have we seen them um, popping up in our area? Depends on the weather. I think we have seen them into the middle of May. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that that's always when i first started case. when i first started looking um the 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 sort of uh, wisdom that i got was like you're gonna it's two weeks in may you get these two weeks and they're either early may they're mid may they're late may um and that was mostly the the wisdom uh about finding yellow morels um you know black morels come a little bit earlier so do punctipes then the yellow morels um, so you have the opportunity to find the two or three varieties there. I don't know about diminutiva. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, you know, it is, it can be more than two weeks, I think. I, I'm, you know, I'm fairly new to this myself, so maybe Paul has more experience. One thing that I do do, though, is I watch Facebook because you will, in February, you start to see people in Georgia, and they are show, showing pictures of morels that they're finding in February in Georgia or early March. And you can just sort of chart the progression up the East Coast. Then you'll see people posting pictures from South Carolina, North Carolina, up through Virginia and Maryland and West Virginia. And you're just basically watching this sort of sweep happen up uh, from South to North of the uh, morel season. And it's pretty fascinating and it helps a lot to figure out when to go out. Um, but well, can I weigh in? You, yeah, please do, Paul. You've got more experience than I do. Well, it, it, the, uh, it, 
the, the first things that come out are the blacks and the, what we used to call semi libras now are their punky bees. And then those are followed uh, by uh, d deliciosa, which we used to call now called diminutiva, yeah. mm -hmm. then the yellows. But we, we discovered that diminutiva actually grow to the size of a yellow morel. Right. But their head is smaller. You know what I mean? The, the top is smaller. Oh, right. the top. They get a very long oh. stem. Yeah. Said, yeah. And, and, and we pick those like around Memorial Day in this general latitude. Oh, wow. But what, I, what, what, what um, Ethan was saying is true. It, it really has to do with progression of, of weather, of warmth, uh, northward. And so, um, and what I do in this is area, I'm, it's I'm going to be somewhere, you know, late April through middle of May, you know. Yeah. And it's and a couple of weeks. It's a couple of weeks. What I do is I am, um, it's pretty early this year, I think. I'm seeing lots of pictures of people I out there early. picking them in Connecticut right now. And uh, I'm bummed that we're having a pandemic. I do, in previous years, I have, um, I have spots in New York City, but I also uh, happen to know a few places in Vermont, so I can actually pick in New York and then pick wait a, a couple weeks, wait a couple weeks, and go to Vermont. And um, maybe not this year. <laughs> Sorry. Any more questions? Can I, can I ask a question about um, if anybody, if you have an idea of how long it takes for them to mature? Um, so if the conditions are right and uh, you've been to your spot, um, but you don't see your morels, um, you know, when, how long does it take for them to grow basically uh, yeah. to maturity? If you see nothing, I would come back in a week and then I'd come back in two weeks. I mean, if you've got the time, it's worth it to sort of, you know, be persistent. Sure. Um, but yeah. But not by the day, by the week. Right. They, yeah. they take a right. little time. Yeah. Gotcha. May I weigh in on that? Surely. Um, so I, I have found um, uh, the shelf life, if you will, to be about a week, where if you see a tiny one, um, by a week, it's going to be, you know, especially if it's damp out, it'll be gone, but it'll, it'll continue growing. Um, uh, and I did an experiment where I found one which was very, very small and very gray. And um, I kept on checking on it, and by a week's time, it was fully, fully grown and actually starting to, to soften and get a little funky. Okay. So, in my experience, it's five about a week. Five or six days. Five, right? So maybe five or six, because a week it's already starting to go. Awesome. Thanks for that experiment. That's good. Can I ask Amanda a question about what she was doing in the kitchen back there? Of course. So when you dehydrate the mushrooms, then do you dry them completely before you start to saute them? You dry them completely, and then once they're dried completely, you rehydrate them in warm water. No, no. Um, before oh, you stick you them in the pan. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, in the pan. No, not completely, but you cook off almost all the liquid. Are you cooking it at like what? What like medium heat? A little medium, medium high. Medium high, and yeah. then. And it's just butter. It's just butter. Little and, salt. And it's a little dry. I added a little bit of the soaking liquid. Okay. To keep it going so that it wouldn't completely dry out by 20 minutes. And then by around 20 minutes, I kind of just let it get a little dry. And then do the add the wine to deglaze. Then wine to deglaze. Wine and cream. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Plays, let the wine cook off, and then cream and chives. Ah, oh, thank you. They're kind of good. I wanted to chime in on something real quick, Amanda, which is that I saw you straining the mushrooms, but I don't think you mentioned it. Yes, I did. After they were soaked, I strained them in order to reserve the liquid. Right. And just a sip. Nothing fancy. Also, um, it, all the dirt will probably accumulate might be stuck to the dried mushrooms will settle to the bottom and you'll scoop them off right, the top. Right, right, so we don't really need to be fancy about it. But yes, exactly, I strained the mushrooms after we soaked them and kept the liquid for the saute. Awesome. Do you wanna, do you wanna share any recipes that you do, Juniper, with the mushrooms or? No? 
Okay. I just wanted to show Monica. Can you? Uh, there we are. Delicious. I'm sorry. I wish I could share with everybody. I really do. Next year. Next year. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, um, Michael, 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 do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, Ethan, uh, first off, thanks a bunch. Presentation hey. was incredible. Good to see you. It's been a, been a while. Uh, uh, so I'm wondering, I, uh, I just found my first morels ever on two separate occasions over the last two weeks. Um, but I'm wondering, is, uh, is it, can connoisseurs taste the differences among species within the genus or yes. is, is it yes? Well, they, they claim they can. Um, I know someone who in the 1980s when there were more abundant uh, seasons with thousands and thousands of morels to be had, wouldn't even bother to bend over to pick up a black morel. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what I found, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, the, the, most of the people who consider themselves connoisseurs uh, prefer the yellow morels. Uh, followed by the black morels, I don't think I can tell the or maybe followed by diminutivas. I don't really know. Um, and then yeah, punctipes is a is a distant fourth, I guess. It, it, um, so is it is it a difference in intensity or in quality? Um, I'm going to say quality, but I'm going to open it up to anybody who wants to to comment because um, I just love the mushrooms I'm eating. Um, Juniper, you want to say something? I did want to say something because we had a morel tasting here at the house with club members about three years ago, and six years ago, six years ago, <laughs> um, and we tasted. Uh, Tom, help me out. We, we tasted two burn morels, one from Washington State, one from Montana. We tasted diminutivas that were collected in New Jersey. We collected punctipes, collected in New York. Tasted. Uh, or tasted. And we had uh, Americana from the year before. And we also tasted Americana, Americana that were 20, that had been dried uh, for 20 years. Oh, interesting. And the Americana were not people's favorites, not everybody's favorites. And it was a blind taste testing. People marked their favorites based on the number that we assigned to each mushroom. And there, we didn't keep the <laughs> we didn't keep good records. So we all have a different memory of what order they came in. But I think we're all in consensus. The, the diminutivas uh, were were very good. Everyone liked them quite a lot. Uh, the black morels that were from uh, the Northeast, I think were preferred to the uh, Morkella Snyderi from the Northwest because they had kind of an acrid uh, taste. But the 20 year old morels were, were great. <laughs> the, uh, the ones from the year before were great. So the, um, people have a lot of ideas that Esculenta Americana are the best. And it's really not true if you taste different species prepared exactly the same way, side by side. That's a testament to sort of how much of the presentation and the visual uh, aspect of food is a, a, is a part of your appreciation of it. Like, the yellow yeah. morel is really just such a handsome mushroom. It must taste the best, right? Yeah. Yeah. So big. Yeah. I would also say about the punctipes that the punctipes is often dismissed. It has a kind of different texture that I think doesn't stand up as well to the way we generally prepare morels. But I think that if you can figure out a way to extract the flavor, um, like in a sauce or something like that, that the flavor is excellent. Oh, good. I'd like to pitch in something. It's actually a hint 
that I got from Laura Biscato, who is an old uh, yeah. member. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you rehydrate the uh, morel, you're going to have that honeycomb part. Yeah. And you're going to have the stem part. And that stem part is a little bit like, uh, you know, Spungili, you know, a little, a, a, a little rubbery thing. Yeah. So what she says is she, and I followed it, and it really adds a lot. Is she uh, really chops up, dices up that the stems, stem part. and I put it in with the shallots. Oh wow! Oh, so it and they longer. and they kind of melt away, and then you add the caps, and oh, uh, yeah. but I think that. Uh, that stem kind of underlies the development of the of the dish. That seems smart. I like that. Neat. Thank you, Paul. I like that. Thank Laura. Yeah, thanks, Laura Biscotto. <laughs> yeah, any more questions? Now we're all getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if there's no more questions, then uh, thank you so much. This is uh, this was uh, really great. I learned a ton. Thank you. And I'm gonna make some. Porto, I'm, I'm gonna make some portobello burgers now. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good mushrooms. laughs> we'll be okay too. All right. But um, does anybody still have any questions? Last chance. Uh, oh, okay. We're here. We're here. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Night, everybody. Uh, that was great, both of you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And come to the next one, too. We have one next week on Tuesday, 7 p.m. It's Lily White. Oh, and right. that one's going to be really fun. Yeah. Lily exactly. is amazing. Okay. So, um, yeah, come back. Uh, it's going to be probably not about mushrooms, but more about music. Okay. Uh, but, yeah. It'll be fantastic. Thank you, Monica. Good meeting, everybody. Thank you. Good meeting. Thank you. Good meeting, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.